Hey, it's good to see you. Uh, Susan and I had this incredible trip to Greece and to Crete, celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary. So uh, anyway, thank you for that time away. Um, this morning, we begin a new uh, sermon series, oh, it doesn't work that way, um, from First Peter. And I know some people might say, why First Peter? <laughs> Well, isn't it obvious? Uh, the title, the title really, uh, here I'm going to set the easier yours, John. The title says it all, First Peter, First Peter. I don't know, that just kind of has a ring to it, don't you, don't you think? So that's number one. Number two, in recent years, uh, we've heard from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John, Paul, Moses, David, Solomon, even Esther and the prophets, but really not from Peter. Some argue that 1 Peter wasn't written by Peter, but the early church was unanimously convinced that it was written by uh, Peter. And in my estimation, all, and I've read a lot on this, all the modern reasons as to why it wasn't written by Peter, in, I think, are stupid. I think it sounds like Peter was written by Peter in Rome around 62 AD, maybe with the help of Silvanus, to groups of common people, most of whom Peter had not met, written about living the Christian life in a hostile, secular, and religious society, which is what I think all of us kind of at least say we'd like to do. And number three, why Peter? Peter says some fascinating stuff that my tribe, my American evangelical Protestant tribe, just has a really hard time explaining. And I find that fascinating. For instance, Peter never refers to the cross. He never calls the cross a cross, but always a tree. That's interesting. Chapter 3, he writes that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison who missed the boat in the days of Noah. That's interesting. Chapter 4, he writes, the gospel was preached to the dead so that judged in the flesh the way people are, in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And then he says, judgment begins with the household of God. It gets even more trippy in 2 Peter. For instance, the whole world is to be flooded with fire, and God wishes that none should perish. That's, that's interesting. But for some, for some I, I think probably the strangest thing of all might be the way that 1 Peter begins. Okay, so this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle, means sent, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect, chosen is what that means, exiles, sojourners, people that are living in another country, of the dispersion, the diaspora in Greek. Diaspora means diaspora. In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge, in Greek prognosis, of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. To you. So, who is you? Well, it kind of seems whoever reads the letter and believes it with maybe just like a mustard seed of, of faith believes that it's written to them. He, he says such amazing things to these people that he's never even met. He says that they are elect. That is, the chosen. He says that they are citizens of another land, sojourning in this land. He calls them diaspora, by the foreknowledge of God the Father, made holy by the Spirit, and obedient to Jesus, sprinkled for sprinkling with, with his blood. In the Old Testament, blood was sprinkled upon people on only three occasions. Number one, when the people of Israel entered the covenant on Mount Sinai, becoming God's own people, his chosen race, his tribe. Number two, when Aaron and his sons were ordained as priests. And number three, blood was sprinkled on lepers whom the priest had declared, declared cleansed and, and now healed. Up until that point, a leper was excluded from the sanctuary. They excluded from the community. And everywhere that they went, they had to shout, unclean, unclean, unclean. 
In the book of Hebrews, we discover that sprinkling with blood meant forgiveness. You see, this is the crazy thing. Peter doesn't seem worried that any unforgiven might accidentally assume that they are forgiven. (laughs) He writes as if everyone that reads this is forgiven. Marcus Bart used to tell us a story about a group of thieves that robbed a bank. Fleeing the police, they abandoned the gold. It was just like a weight of glory, too great for any one of them to carry. They abandoned the gold, and then they hid in the swamp. Meanwhile, there was a trial. The judge found them guilty, but commuted the sentence and granted a full pardon. The authorities then sent search parties into the swamp looking for the thieves in order to tell them that they were pardoned. But every time the thieves heard the bloodhounds barking, they they only hid deeper and deeper and deeper in the swamp, and so they hid from grace. And then Marcus Bart would ask his seminary students, were those thieves forgiven (laughs) or not forgiven? You see, Peter writes as if all have been forgiven and all are now tempted to hide in the swamp. So Peter says such amazing things to these people, things that God had said to Israel. And yet we'll see that many or most of these folks were not Jews. He's writing to people in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, all regions of modern-day Turkey all primarily Gentiles. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, and he's writing to Galatians, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, written about 10 years before this, Paul tells them how he confronted Peter in Antioch for pandering to the Jews. But now Peter is writing to the Galatians and talking as if the Galatians are Jews. 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, God's own people that you might declare the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean. In the greeting, he refers to them as the diaspora. In Jesus' day, even as today, the term was used to refer to the Jews or the 12 tribes of Israel, which is different than the Jews, by the way. But the Jews dispersed throughout the nations as a punishment but with a promise to come home. Deuteronomy 28, just before Moses dies, God informs the Israelites that if they break the covenant, they will be cursed and dispersed throughout all the nations of the world and that their dead bodies, quote, will become food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And then in Deuteronomy 30, verse 1, God says, when all these things come upon you, so there's no if for God, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, verse 3, then the Lord your God will gather you again from all the people where the Lord your God has scattered you, and bring you into this land, and circumcise your heart, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, that you may live. It is such an outrageous and incredible promise that hardly anyone believes it, particularly the Jews. In fact, many of them think that they have to make this happen with guns and tanks in the Middle East. Tragically, there are other tribes that violently disagree with that proposition. (laughs) I wrote this message on Thursday and Friday and then woke up, turned on the news on Saturday morning and I thought, oh crap. Maybe I shouldn't talk about this stuff. And then I felt like God whispered, no, this is exactly why you have to talk about this stuff. Deuteronomy 30, verse 3, Then the Lord your God will gather you again from all the people where the Lord your God has scattered you, 
and bring you into this land and circumcise your heart so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Such an outrageous, incredible promise that hardly anyone believes it, particularly the Jews. Many of them think that they have to make sure this promise happens with guns and tanks, but they cannot circumcise their own hearts. And they cannot raise the dead to whom the promise was made. And then here in 1 Peter 1-2, Peter talks as if the promise was not only made to them, but also to Gentiles. He talks as if they are members, the Gentiles, as if the members are Gentiles of his own tribe. He talks as if one day everyone that's anyone is destined to walk through the 12 gates, like the 12 tribes and the 12 disciples of the new Jerusalem, which is coming down. And I have learned the hard way that talking like this gets some people incredibly angry. You see, Peter talks as if our God is not simply our own tribal deity. Vincent Donovan was a missionary to the Maasai tribe in Tanzania. In his book, Christianity Rediscovered, he shares how the Maasai, just like all the other tribes in Africa, he says, uh, believed in the high God, the creator God, but they also believed that the high God loved their tribe more than any of the other tribes. One day, Father Donovan told them of Abraham and how Abraham uh, was called by the high God to leave his land his people, his tribe, so that the high God could teach him and his children about himself. But he also shared that they were tempted to make the high God their own tribal God. When God had told Abraham that they were blessed to be a blessing to all the nations, all the peoples, all the tribes of the world. When he finished, one of the Maasai said, this story of Abraham does it speak only to the Maasai, or does it speak also to you? Has your tribe found the high God? Have you known him? Father Donovan started to give a, a glib answer when he thought of Joan of Arc, and how the French viewed God. And then he said he thought of, about Americans, and how Americans viewed God, and always seemed to think that God was on their side in any war. And then he thought of how a Nazi once told them that they could always count on Catholic school children to pray for the Fuhrer. He was silent a long time. And then he said, no, we have not found the high God. My tribe has not known him. For us too, he is the unknown God, but we, we are searching for him. I have come a long, long distance to invite you to search for him with us. Let us search for him together. Maybe together we will find him. One day a Maasai elder said this to him. This high God of whom you speak, he could not possibly love Christians more than pagans, could he? Or he would be more of a tribal God than ours. Recently, a friend from here at the sanctuary told me that her longtime prayer partner from high school refused to pray with her anymore because she had voted for the wrong candidate in the last election. I mean, I cannot remember a time when Christendom in America was more tribal. When we make the high God into a tribal God, we make God incredibly small. And we make everyone in our tribe look just the same. We judge each other according to our tribal markers. Things like political affiliation, language, dietary practices, clothing, tattoos, circumcision. <laughs> circumcision, which is a fascinating tribal marker because it's not one that you like just normally see, right? Unless you go to the gym. And uh, it's one that refers to the heart. And no one can circumcise their, their own heart. Well, it's not surprising to me that in American Christianity, there's been this real fascination with reclaiming our Jewish tribal roots. 
And it's not surprising to me that the New Testament so earnestly warns against the temptations of such an endeavor, the temptation of what Luke and Rabbi Paul call the circumcision party. <laughs> Sounds like a great party, huh? You want to go to a circumcision party? Hoo-hoo. And it's not surprising to me that upon close examination, the content of 1 Peter seems so strange to us, modern American, rather tribal believers. So how is it that Peter the Jew, the leader of the 12 disciples, like the 12 tribes and the 12 gates, could, act, could talk as if, as if Gentiles that he didn't even know belonged to his own tribe? As if his tribe were everyone's tribe. So I don't think we can understand 1 Peter until we understand what it was that happened to Peter in Acts chapter 10. Okay, this is also kind of our last sermon from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. A cohort was 600 Roman soldiers, and a centurion was commander of 100 of those soldiers. They were on the metric system, centurion, so 100 soldiers. Hopefully remember that it was a centurion and some of his men who had nailed Peter's best friend to a tree in a garden and who still occupied his nation his tribe, through brutality, shame, and fear. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, about three o'clock, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended us a memorial before God and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, about noon, to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And so the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descended, uh, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, no way, by no means, Lord. Does your prayer life ever sound like this? Anyway, he said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, katharizo, it's where we get our word catharsis. What God has cleansed, do not, imperative tense, do not call common. You must not call common, koinao, to make common to defile. A voice from heaven, what God has cleansed, Peter, you must not call common. Now, the idea of cleansing common is not totally unfamiliar to us COVID-conscious American believers, right? But how it relates to food and Gentiles is a little unusual for us, and yet not entirely. Eating food is a rather intimate and bizarre activity when you think about it. We ingest a life. That's what all food is. It's a life that we kill and ingest and make a part of our, our own flesh. And a smelly brown blob that comes out the other end of our flesh. And it all looks pretty much the same, common and unclean. Jesus said it not, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles, koinao, makes common a person, Matthew 15, 11. But what comes out of a person is what defiles, makes common a person, Mark 7, 20. In both Mark and Matthew, I think Jesus was talking about poop. And talking poop. And just being generally all around poopy, like everyone else. So you see, we can commune with another life the way we commune with fried chicken and make that life part of our own flesh and a piece of poop. Or we can commune with another life the way a groom communes with a bride 
makes her part of his own life and maybe even another life called a baby. Now, if that observation bothers you, I'm sorry, but it just might be significant. Well, I was just saying that eating is a rather intimate activity. And relating to other people can be a rather intimate activity. When God called Abraham to leave his tribe, and likewise called his children, the children of Israel, to separate from the other tribes of the world, in Leviticus 20, 24, through Moses, he said this to them, I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean, and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Now, that seems rather bizarre in light of some of the things that Jesus has said, but, but God gave the Israelites all these dietary laws and even circumcision as some sort of tribal marker. So the Israelites knew that they were not to be like all the tribes, all the other tribes that surrounded them. 1,500 years later, Jesus would reveal in his rather cryptic way that no one seemed to understand at the time, that it really wasn't what was eaten that defiled a person, but how it was eaten. <laughs> With or without regard to the Creator, like Paul wrote, everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. So lobster and bacon's on the menu. But only if you say thank you. Nonetheless, in the Old Covenant, the idea was that only those that were ritually clean and morally clean could approach God to commune with him, to dine with him in his sanctuary. The temple was like a giant cafeteria, and the cool kids sat in the middle. There were a variety of ways that one could become unclean, and all sorts of prescribed rituals to make a person ritual clean, but only God could make a soul clean. At the temple, there was a dividing wall and a sign written in Greek, which archaeologists have actually unearthed. They've actually unearthed two of these. This is one of these in the museum in Turkey. It says, no stranger, thus Gentile, is to enter. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. And they meant it. You remember from a few weeks ago, that's why they tried to kill Paul. They accused him of bringing a Gentile past this sign and the dividing wall of hostility. Pay attention and you'll see that this is also why they actually killed Jesus, crucified Jesus. He appeared to be breaking down that dividing wall of hostility. It seemed, it seemed that the king of the Jews was betraying the tribal deity, the small one, through whom they tried to make everyone just the same. Now, hopefully this all raises some questions, questions like, why would Yahweh, El Elyon, Lord God Almighty, the high God, make himself like a, a tribal God with tribal markers, like no lobster, no bacon. I think it's kind of like the question, why would the Lord God Almighty, the high God, make himself a particular man with a particular face and a weak body that other particular men could break, make bleed, and nail to a tree? Those are important questions. We'll get back to those in just a minute. But the voice from heaven says, what God has cleansed, I suppose that you could never know what it is to be cleansed unless you knew what it was to be unclean and common. The voice says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. That word common is just a fascinating word in Greek and English. In Greek, it's koinos, which can be translated as common, or profane, as in defiled. So just the word implies that every common thing is an unclean thing. As if the whole world, every common thing, has somehow been defiled. 
Koinos is the root of koinonia, which translates as fellowship or communion. In English, the word common is also the root of communion and community and communism and commoner. Common means shared, same, or, or normal. And so this gets really confusing because we all want to be common and uncommon. We all want to be normal and abnormal, right? We all want to be the same and unique. And of course, there are different forms of communion. But just think about it. We all want to be the same in order to fit in. Why? Because we're all terrified of being alone. But we each want to be different for fear that we're just like everyone else and therefore not even ourselves, which we don't really know what that is, not even ourselves, which therefore means that we really have nothing to share with others. It's ironic, but in an effort to make ourselves unique, we make ourselves just the same. In high school, everyone wanted to be unique, but we would only be unique together. And so the jocks wore letter jackets, formed a tribe, tribe and, and, and ate together, ate lunch together. The stoners grew their hair, smelled like pot, and ate together. The Christians displayed their Bible covers, acted joyful, and ate together. It's what fashion's all about. I mean, this is really hilarious once you see it, but you just pay attention to commercials and see how many commercials are selling individuality by getting you to purchase a product that makes you just like everyone else. Separate yourself from the crowd by joining our crowd and becoming just like us. When Adam and Eve bit the fruit, gained knowledge, and began to judge themselves, they covered up their individuality, invented fashion, and began to really struggle with communion. And then their children formed tribes, fashioned tribal gods in their own image, and went to war with each other. And in that way, they were all just the same. It's the way of the flesh. It's common. We judge others out to, to judge ourselves in, into outer darkness. In an effort to make ourselves unique, we make ourselves just the same. And in an effort to make ourselves just the same, we don't know who we are or anyone else is, and so can never know love. That is real communion. So maybe the problem is with our effort. And the assumption that we can make ourselves in the image of God. We got no idea who God is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if this doesn't make sense to your head, perhaps it makes sense to your heart. In second grade, there was a girl in my school that was abnormal, uncommon, and different. Her name was Sharon. The most formative hour of, <laughs> of school was lunch. Because the adults just put all of us second graders in one room and we had to figure out where to sit. And our hearts knew who you ate lunch with, who you communed with, mattered. We each wanted to be special, but we were terrified of eating alone, and so we formed tribes. Judging others out and judging ourselves in to, to be one of the in. But at 12 o'clock, all the tribes seemed to be united for at 12 o'clock, we all lifted our feet off the floor and yelled, Cootie hour! And, and just started laughing. The theory was that cooties could travel across the floor at 12 o'clock and infect us. And that all the cooties came from Sharon, whom I always remember eating alone, even if there were other girls around her. Sharon knew that this was what was happening because none of the boys would touch her. She was unclean. 
where maybe we were unclean and just bound together by evil, an evil communion that is not actually communion. And here's the really, really strange thing. Sharon was easily the prettiest girl in second grade. That's how she was different. That's how she was uncommon. That's how she was abnormal. She was genuinely beautiful and feminine, and we devoured her. I don't remember Sharon ever smiling, which isn't beautiful. So, with our judgment, you see, we were shaping her in our image. In high school, Sharon was Susan's locker mate and friend, and still gorgeous. But I don't remember her smiling. And I don't remember her ever dating. I was still a little intimidated by her, because <laughs> she's still gorgeous, and I was a little ashamed of, that I had been a part of all of that in second grade. And I always wanted to tell her, Sharon, I hope you know by now that all the boys in second grade, well, they said you had cooties because you were the prettiest girl. You were the most feminine presence in all of second grade. I wouldn't have said it this way, but I could have said it this way. Sharon, they said those things about you for the same reason they crucified Jesus. He was glorious. And they were jealous of Jesus and afraid for themselves. You know, there are two ways that you can relate to Jesus, uh, bride of Christ. You can consume him like fruit on a tree, or you can commune with him like a bride communes with her bridegroom. You can try and make him like yourself, or you can let him make you himself, his body, his bride. In his book, The Way to Glory, C.S. Lewis writes this, It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or another of these destinations, and I would add, actually, both. You see, there is something beastly and monstrous about you. Something common and defiled. And yet, there is something utterly glorious, clean, and uncommon hidden within you. When we judge according to our own flesh, we make God small, and we make every one just the same common and abominable. In fact, to the Pharisees, Jesus called that the abomination, justifying yourself before men. But when we surrender to the Spirit, we allow God to be the creator of all. And we allow all to be the utterly unique and individual works of art that they truly are. They are the judgment of God. Let us make Adam in our own image, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When Adam and Eve bit the fruit, when you began to justify yourself by judging everyone else, you hid the creation of God in the desecration of man. You wrapped yourself and your neighbor and all creation in fig leaves. You made everything common, unclean, and alone in outer darkness. That's your judgment, Adam. And it cannot change the judgment of God. And that's the gospel. Acts 10 verse 15, And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. On a Friday night as Jesus was being tried, Peter sat with his countrymen around a fire in the courtyard of the high priest. Terrified of being alone and wanting to fit in, he denied Jesus three times, invoking a curse. When Jesus rose from the dead, he sat by a fire on the side of the sea and offered Peter a communion of fish served for breakfast. And three times he said, Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And three times Jesus said, feed my sheep. Peter, 
Simon was the name that his parents had given him, but Peter, which means rock, was the name that Jesus gave him. You are rock. And on this rock, this unmoving permanent thing, I will build my church. So just when all of Peter's judgments indicated that he was anything but a rock, Jesus called him rock three times. And Jesus is the judgment of God, the logos, the word of the creator. And then when Peter said, well, what about this guy comparing himself to John? Jesus said, what is that to you, Peter? So maybe first Peter isn't a bad name for this book. First Peter. First Peter, you must believe my judgment of grace over you before you can declare my judgment of grace over all of humanity. When you know my forgiveness of you, you will proclaim that I am the Savior of the world. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Peter's house, stood at the gate. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Apostello, these men are apostles sent to the apostle. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What's the reason of your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, two ideas that just did not go together in Peter's brain, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. They're selling this to Peter because they realize it's going to be a hard thing for Peter to buy, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them, Peter invited them to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Notice it's Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted it up, saying, Stand up! I too am a man. And as he talked to him, or talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know, you all know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. Great way to start a sermon, right? You all know how wrong it is for me to be talking to you. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Wow. He said, any person. You see, if you're not common, you are what the Bible calls holy. And if you're not unclean, then you're clean. What the Bible calls forgiven. God has shown me that I should call no man, no woman, common or unclean. Now, you could take that as meaning that we just don't know who's common or unclean. In which case, you'd be really smart to treat everyone as uh, uncommon and clean, holy and forgiven. Or this could mean that everyone is holy and forgiven and they just don't know it yet. In which case, you might want to tell them. Well, that would be like good news. As we'll see in a minute, it's clear that Cornelius is holy and forgiven. And in Peter's mind, and, and in the mind of those that read Luke Acts, because this is in Luke Acts, remember, when would that cleansing have happened? Wouldn't it have been right after the centurion nails God in flesh to a tree? And Jesus, the judgment of God, says, Father, forgive them. Luke 23, 34, and Luke 23, 47. The centurion began praising God, saying, this man was innocent. That is, this man was clean. This man was utterly uncommon. This man is, is glorious. Father, forgive them. Who's them? Well, it's at least the centurion, right? But it's not only the centurion. It's the judgment of Adam, that is, humanity, to take his life on the tree. 
and it's the judgment of God to give his life on the tree and so make Adam, make humanity in his own image and who is God. God is a communion of sacrificial love, which is the life of the age, the Ionios, to come. God became man that man would become himself, his body and bride. God became a tribal deity to reveal that all are made members of his tribe at a tree in a garden at the edge of space and time. In other words, Jesus is the king of the Jews and king of all creation, his tribe. He will separate each one of us from the tribes of this world. That's an incredibly painful experience. He will separate each one of us from the tribes of this world, the crowds that are a cancer, in order to give each of us his communion of love so that we would each go back to the crowds bearing witness to this love as we watch him turn the cancer into a body, his own body. Works the other way in this world, right? But he's the author of this world. He turns cancers into a body. In a body, each member is utterly unique, and yet all members share equally in a common life, the life that's in the blood, the breath, the Spirit of God. The thing that makes you clean is love. And the thing that makes you unclean is believing the lie that the love belongs only to you or your tribe. God is love. And all real love is God. 1028. God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I, I asked them, why did you send for me? Cornelius then tells Peter everything that's happened and begs Peter to say whatever the Lord tells him to say. Verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. Oh, that's hard for Calvinists to hear. God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, not some, he says all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. All, not some. And you see, maybe that's true. I mean, maybe it actually happened. Maybe the devil has already lost. It is finished. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen as witnesses. Chosen as witnesses to what, Peter? The idea that you and your friends were chosen for unspeakable blessing while the ones you speak to or others were maybe chosen for endless torment? Or were you chosen to be witnesses to the fact that God has chosen to save? For God is in fact salvation in a word Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh is salvation. Are you witnessing to God is salvation or we are salvation? Jesus or Mises or Weezes? Verse 40, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. <laughs> wow, just imagine if you could eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Like have, you know, communion with him. Who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach, to announce not to barter or make deals, to announce to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge, to be judge of the living and the dead. The one who cried, Father, forgive them on the tree at the edge of space and time. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Jesus, Yeshua, God is salvation. But, but notice, Peter did not say God called us to preach so that if folks agree with our preaching, they might be forgiven of their sins. He said God called us to preach so that they might receive forgiveness of sins. That's forgiveness that's already happened. 
already been given. You see, we're called to drain the swamp by preaching the gospel. No criminal wants to remain in the swamp once they truly see that they've been forgiven. In 2 Peter, Peter's even going to say it. Your problem is you don't believe you're forgiven for your former, former sins. 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, the logos. It's not Peter that's doing the work. It's the word that's doing the work and has invited Peter to come along and share in his joy. The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. This is Pentecost. Pentecost is all sorts of unique people uniquely praising our one God who is loved. Pentecost is a party. And the thing that wrecks a party is people who refuse to be themselves because they're intent on being someone else or impressing their neighbor or beating their neighbor and so they can't love their neighbor or be themselves, the glorious and unique creation of the one God, our Father, that they truly are. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these guys? So they're not baptized in order to get something from God. They're baptized to proclaim that the old man is dead and the new man has been set free, that they are no longer common, they're clean. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these guys who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? Peter then recounts everything that happens, the whole story, to the circumcision party that is no party, understand? He recounts the whole story, concluding with this thought, verse 17. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, the Jews, right? When we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying then to the Gentiles, not some Gentiles, the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance. Repentance is not a work you do. It's a gift that is given to the Gentiles and the Jews, and that's everyone. God has granted repentance that leads to life. So much to say and no time to say it. So I'll just say this. Do not... Call any person common or unclean. For what God has cleansed, you must not call common. You are not common. You are unique. Each one of you is unique. You are an irreplaceable, indestructible, unique, insanely valuable creation of love. Whether you know it right now or not. And I'm betting pretty most of you, you don't know it, but you are. And now turn and look at someone else, okay? Turn and look at them. And if you're looking at me, I even count, but look at someone else and listen to me closely. They're not common. They are a unique and irreplaceable creation of love, whether you or they know it right now or not. But when you both know it, everything dead will begin to live. From the night that he was betrayed by every kid in the lunchroom, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. That's a different response, huh? Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it. All of you. Peter. Judas. James. John. Do it in remembrance of me. According to Gallup, there are three things that Americans most want to hear. 
Number one, I love you. Number two, I forgive you. Number three, it's time for dinner. And that means this is good news. The king of the Jews is the king of creation. And it's time for dinner. Amen. And so, Lord God, we thank you that there's joy in the house of the Lord. It's always daytime in the house of the Lord. And the gates of the city are always open by day. Father, I, I got up this morning and turned on the news and heard that hundreds of Israelis have been taken captive into Gaza. So they're in Gaza. And I just got a pit in my stomach thinking of how they would look into those faces filled with rage and wonder if they were going to be tortured, if they're going to die, why they hated them so. And then, Lord God, I thought of Gaza. Two million people living in 141 square miles when the city limits of Denver are 157. And they would say that they've been held captive by Israel. Oh God, and then I thought of Israel. I mean, just before I was born, my dad was in that war and Millions were burned in ovens and held captive by Germans. And then I thought of Germany. At the end of World War I, Lord God, they thought they were held captive by the world. Beaten. Poor. And so it was easy to listen to the Fuhrer. And then, Lord God, I think of this world, and Rabbi Paul says that we're all being held captive to the principalities and powers, the world rulers of this present darkness, the tribal deities. And so, Lord God, right now I pray uh, for your chosen witnesses. Because it's easy for me to talk about this stuff in Denver, Colorado, on a nice, beautiful day. But when they're nailing you to a tree, it's hard to preach the gospel. At least it is for me, but maybe not for you, Lord Jesus. So I pray that you would speak through your witnesses in Gaza. Lord, I know there's, there's people that call themselves Christians there. There's also people that call themselves something else, but, but they love you. I speak, I pray for your, your witnesses in Israel, Lord, your chosen witnesses. I pray for your chosen witnesses in Germany and in America and throughout the world, that, Lord God, we would have courage to preach the gospel, to give this message, like, hey, Dad, Dad says he loves you, and he forgives you, and it's time for dinner right now. God, I pray that you give them courage to preach. And in Jesus' name, we speak against the principalities and powers and the world rulers of the present darkness, and we proclaim, you've lost, and we know you've lost. And so we're going to begin to party even now. In Jesus' name, we believe the gospel. Amen.